<laughs> Hello and welcome to our 10th Women's Studies Lecture Series. I can't believe there's been 10 now. Um, I'm Dr. Paula Martin. I am a professor, associate professor of history and director of Women's Studies here at GSW. Tonight's topic is history of women in science or women in science. So good topic. Um, Female students are incredibly successful when it comes to competing with men for slots in graduate schools, and indeed they account for almost half of all the PhD degrees in science and in engineering here in America. But the numbers change dramatically when it comes to the number of women who are actually employed in academia as professors especially, because women make up about 21% of full science professors and less than 5% of engineering professors. So recent research into why this is and why there are so few women in scientific positions in academia uh, yield a really not so surprising results. Let me give you an example. Last year, Yale University put a great big study out, or they published a study that showed that scientists, women or male scientists, were viewed far more favorably in academia than female scientists, scientists that had the exact same qualifications. So the research for this study that Yale did is very simple. Uh, they presented uh, several major research universities with identical summaries of two prospective candidates for employment. They, about the only difference was that one was a male and one was a female. Overwhelmingly, these universities chose to hire the male candidate, and if they did hire a woman, they paid her about $4,000 less than they would her male counterpart. All right, so women have always had a pretty precarious relationship when it comes to employment in the sciences. Uh, the roots of gender bias date back to the origins of science itself when men ruled the day. Women often took secondary, if any, roles at all. So we here at GSW are somewhat ahead of the curve here when it comes to hiring women scientists and we are better off for it. I've asked three of our science professors to share with you their own personal experiences and how they beat the odds to be here today. Our first professor is Dr. Elizabeth Gurnack. Dr. Gurnack received her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. She is a full professor and she chairs the Department of Chemistry. She is also the former director of our university's <laughs> honors program. You just still chair, right? <laughs> the I, um, I am no longer co-chair of the honors program. Oh, oh, and I am an associate <laughs> professor, but thank you for the promotion. The promotion, anytime. <laughs> anyway, our second speaker is Dr. Nellie Yordanova. She received, actually she began her PhD at Notre Dame. She received her PhD from the Pennsylvania State University in physical chemistry. She is an associate professor <laughs> here at GSW and has won the coveted uh, Featured Scholar Award that in 2013. Our last speaker is Dr. Stephanie Harvey. Dr. Harvey received her PhD from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in plant and soil science, specifically core ecology and physiology. Uh, she is a full professor, professor. <laughs> she is a full professor and uh, bravely chairs the uh, biology department. Uh, one last little side note, you may be interested to know that all three of our professors are highly published and then in some of the most prestigious journals in the world. We are very lucky to have them here with us today. Please help me welcome all of our speakers. Thank you, Paula. I'm going to start out, and oh, wow, that is one heck of a screen. I'm going to start out and talk a little bit about a history of science, or a history of women in science, a very little bit, 
Um, and it's going to echo what Paula said. And I'm just going to give you some uh, illustrations of some of the reasons why I think women have a hard time going forward in the field of science. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, what is it that's kept women from making their mark in science? I say this because if I were to ask you um, how many male scientists you could name, you could probably come up with at least a half a dozen, depending on who, what you do for a living. But you probably would have a hard time coming up with more than one or two names for women, famous women scientists throughout the years. And um, the three things that really have a big role in uh, keeping women from progressing and becoming, uh, there's a lot of women in science, it's that we don't know about them. And they've had a hard time getting there. So, and what's really made it hard for them is that lack of role models and mentors. And that's something that's very near and dear to my heart. I'll talk about that later. And also the, the historical perspective of, of a woman's intellect, not particularly favorable. And societal expectations. So let me use some examples to uh, illustrate some of these here. In uh, 1976, Isaac Asimov published a book, Biographical Encyclopedia of Science and Technology. Among the 1,195 scientists in this book, 10 were women. In 1950, Singer's History of Science had no women listed in it. There, um, I'm also going to, I grew up in the 60s, I don't know if you can tell, but I did. Grew up in the 60s and 70s, and um, there were no, absolutely no, female scientist mentors or role models, either in the news or in media or in our popular culture, other than with the, with the exception of Marie Curie. I knew about her. I think everybody knows about her. But people did not write about women scientists. People did, we didn't know about them. And one of the reasons, and, and you can ask, is it because there were no women scientists? Or is it because they simply didn't get the press that they needed to have? And um, I think partially it's both. There are, have been fewer women scientists than men scientists, that's for sure. And also, the work that they've done has not been acknowledged. And you'll see some of that. So, Historically, women have been perceived as having an intellect incapable of the kind of inquiry that natural science, natural philosophy, and science requires. I'm going to illustrate some of that by looking at the opportunities for higher education that have been afforded to women. I'm not going to look very deep. You don't have to. Then we're going to look at some of the opportunities um, beyond the university. Most science, a lot of science is done in universities. Universities were originally put together in order to foster um, and possibly you could say control the development of natural philosophy. Uh, but a lot of science gets done, discussed, propagated, advertised, and disseminated in other places. Uh, research. Um, you have to have opportunities to do research. There are academic and scientific societies that people can belong to where a lot of scientific discussion takes place. You have to be able to publish. It helps if you want to um, encourage women to be in science, to pay them for their job, um, which was an issue for a real long time. And it also helps as far as building up a uh, group of mentors for, for young people coming up that you credit the women that do the work for the contributions that they've made. These are issues that have been a problem for a while and we just want to illustrate some of that. Higher education. So let us compare 
the higher educations, the universities that have been open to men, and when the universities became open to women. The first university of, um, that had an actual charter as a university was the University of Boulogne in 1088. And guess when men were admitted? 1088. Okay, no women. All of these, these are, this is just a collection of some of the first universities um, in Europe and in the, in the world. And, and women, and, and rather men were invi invited and accepted and admitted at that time. It took about 800 years for the United States to open Oberlin College, which was the first co-ed instructional college. In 1855, the University of Iowa becomes the first public or state university in the United States that is co-educational. In 1867, Zurich formally opens to women. They'd already allowed women to come to lectures and audit lectures and attend um, some of the courses, but not get any credit for it. In 1867, they decided to actually allow women to uh, enroll. In 1869, Russian universities open up um, their courses to women. <coughs> And in 1891, Germany finally allowed women to attend university lecture, lectures. And individual professors in the German institutions had the, had the option of allowing a, a woman to come in and be a student of theirs. A woman couldn't just go into the university. She had to be invited in by a professor. Um, by the mid-1900s, uh, not very long ago, for the most part, um, universities accepted women into, high, into their institutions around the world. There's obviously some exceptions to that, but for the most part, any institutions that currently allow women allow them by the mid-1900s. So, Men have had the benefit of a formal education in science for a lot longer than women have. In addition to, I know you can't read this, don't, don't even try, okay? In addition though, um, there are conferences, very important conferences that ha have been taken place. Um, the Congress of Karlsruhe, which is one of the most famous chemistry conferences when the beginning of real chemistry was going on, a group of some very, Schmanky people, um, headed by Kakule, uh, got together and uh, for several days in 1860, there were 140 attendees, all of them were male. And previous to this conference, there were actually some women who um, engaged in scientific discourse, experimentation, uh, collaborated with male scientists, but once this once this conference finished, they were, they were totally behind the curve because they had, were, did not attend this conference. They did not have any formal communication from this conference. And it made it very difficult for any women to keep up at that point. There are also academic societies. London's Royal Academy was founded in 1660. Women and um, there were um, other societies which were created in 1829, the Zoological Society, and in 1833, the Royal Entomological Society. Both of those societies, for reasons I cannot explain, accepted women from the day they were founded. But the actual Royal Academy did not admit women until 1945. And she became a full fellow of the Royal Academy. Paris is, in France is even more intriguing. In 1699, somewhat in um, competition to the Royal Academy in London, Paris instituted the Royal Academy of Sciences, which was a sort of a club, a gentleman's club of science. People would get together in different salons around Paris and talk about, I don't know, vapor pressure or something, I'm not sure what. Um, in 1795, it was refounded as the National Institute of Sciences. At that point, it became part of the government. And women were not admitted until 1962. Uh, Margaret Perret was a correspondent member, which means she wasn't a full member. The first full member in the National Institute of Sciences in France was in 17, or I mean in 1979. 
she became the first full member. This is, rem this is absolutely stunning because of this woman right here. Marie Curie, born in Poland but a naturalized French citizen, the most famous si woman scientist ever, I would, I would posit. If anybody here knew a woman scientist, you probably knew her name. She was the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize. She is the only person to receive two Nobel Prizes in different sciences. In 1903, in physics, for radiation theory, along with her husband and uh, Becquerel. And in 1911, she won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for her discovery of radium. She was also the first woman to become a professor of the University of Paris. But was she fit to be part of that institution? Apparently not. Oh, this is just a picture. This is the Solvay Conference in 1911. Um, these are all the great scientists of the time. There's I, um, Einstein and there's a whole bunch of other guys. Here's Marie Curie right here. Apparently, in order to get into the institute, you had to have a mustache. <laughs> and she didn't have one, so. Uh, she was probably the most, she was one of the most famous scientists of her day as well, so. I also, um, Gertrude, Gertrude Elian graduated summa cum laude from Hunter College in 1937. She tried to get into graduate school, but 15 schools rejected her application because she was a woman. That was all they said. She worked at various laboratories, um, mostly without pay. She taught at New York High School in order to earn some money so she could go to the New York University part-time to finish her degree. She applied for one job and was rejected as a laboratory dishwasher because she was overqualified but was not allowed to uh, apply for the jobs for which she was qualified because she was a woman. 1944, she, worked with, she started working with George Hitchings at Burroughs Wellcome on nucleic acids, and they were in pharmacology, and they, they um, ended up in 1988 sharing the Nobel Prize in medicine. So she overcame a lot, but she was excluded from a great deal of opportunity, one would think, because of the fact that, merely because she was a woman. Now, this young lady, this, I love this painting. This is a painting of um, Antoine Lavoisier, the father of chemistry, the father of modern chemistry, and his lovely wife, who is Marie-Anne. She was an active experimentalist with her husband. She did all of the experiments with Antoine Lavoisier. And she edited and translated all of his works, as well as the works of Joseph Priestley, Henry Cavendish, and William Henry. Henry's Law, if you've had chemistry with me, you know about Henry's Law, you know all these guys. But she never got credit for it. And she, neither did she get any kind of remuneration or credit, and people would never know who she was. But she did just as much work as uh, Lavoisier did. Lisa Meitner was born in 1878 and died in 1968. She worked in Berlin's um, chemistry institute in the basement because women were not allowed on any of the upper floors. And in fact, it was only Emile Fischer's largesse that allowed her into the basement. There was no re women restroom in the basement, so she had to go out to go to the restroom. But she was so anxious and so excited about learning more chemistry and physics that she snuck upstairs into the auditorium, similar to this, and hid underneath the chairs to listen to the chemistry lectures. She kind of got back at it because 10 years later, she was the director for the Center of Radiation Physics in Berlin. So they let her, they let her in eventually. Um, in 1938, she interpreted the experiment of the century uh, which led the way towards the whole uh, nuclear chemistry. She, by explaining that the nucleus of an atom could split and release large amounts of energy. It was her male German partner, Otto Hahn, who received the Nobel Prize for that work. That was work that she initiated, she directed, and interpreted. She did not win the Nobel Prize for that. 
societal expectations are probably is I think that we can probably since we're here in this institution right now we can probably agree that women have access to education in a relatively uh, equal footing as men at least here in the United States but the societal expectations are are strong they run deep in this in this uh, culture and they are still very strong men are expected to have a successful career period women are expected to take care of the home and the family they may be allowed to have a career they may even be encouraged to have a career but it certainly isn't expected of them and that is still true today I think in a lot of ways it makes it very difficult to believe that women, if you are going to do an experiment and put a man next to a woman, who are you going to hire? You're going to hire the man because you're going to expect that he's going to be there and working 110% every day, whereas the woman is going to be off doing other things, using only a small percentage of her effort towards that job. That attitude is still alive and well today. This is great. Max Planck, one of the great scientists of the world, right? Um, it, he worked at the institute with uh, Lisa Meitner, and she actually audited one of his courses. And he stated that he had had nothing but favorable experiences, but on the other hand, it must, I must keep to the fact that such cases must be regarded as exceptions, because generally it cannot be emphasized enough that nature herself prescribed to the woman her function as mother and housewife, and that laws of nature cannot be ignored under any circumstances without grave danger. So that's, um, that attitude is, pretty, is alive and well today. It looks pretty obnoxious to me to see it up on the board like that, but we still, we still come across it. And it's not just in the past and even in the present it's not just men thinking that of women women think it of themselves as well Marie Murdoch um, published the first chemistry book for women and uh, which has this name which I will not attempt to say because it's in French and I'm not very good at that but she waited two years to publish it she worked for years and years and years on her experiments and and coming up with all of her um, procedures and her observations. She had a beautiful um, body of knowledge to share, but she waited several years to uh, publish it because she objected. I objected to myself that it was not the profession of a lady to teach and learn without display. She should remain silent, listen and learn without displaying her own knowledge. It's not her station to offer to the work, her work to the public a reputation gained thereby is not ordinarily to her advantage, since men always scorn and blame the product of a woman's mind. And I hope that we don't have to have women thinking this of themselves ever again. So, but women are in science. There are many women in science today. They're still underpaid compared to their male counterparts, pretty much across the board. They receive less than their share of grant money and awards. The representation of women in the sciences in no way um, mirrors the, reputation, the uh, representation of women receiving notable awards. They make up a very, very small portion of the leadership in science. This is um, data from 2011 from the Committee um, on Women in Science. If you look at um, males and females in the science with, with degrees in the science fields. Um, you can see that all degrees, men have a, more than twice as many degrees in science as women do. At the pH, it's over twice as well. And as far as being employed, the um, Men and women, if you look at all degrees, women are more employed than men, but men are more men are employed as PhDs than women. And um, if you look at the their 
their ranks, women in the rank of professor versus men. It's about twice as many men in, in, at that rank as there are women. I just thought I'd throw this up here because I think you have to know that there's a lot of really important women out here, out there that have done really important things that you interact with every single day. Now, here's uh, Margaret Knight invented the machine that makes paper bags, okay, in 1871. Mary Anderson invented the windshield wiper in 1903. Hedy Lamar invented several things um, involving uh, coding of, or uh, coding machi anti-coding machines for the, for the war effort, but she also invented something called, with other people, um, spread spectrum technology, which is used um, to power your cell phones, or to um, allow your, not so much to power it, but to allow your cell phones and other things like that to communicate. Uh, Marion Donovan invented the disposable diapers. I think that's a real fine thing for a woman to have invented. Um, Betty Nesmith Graham invented liquid paper. Ruth Handler invented the Barbie doll. Dr. Grace Murray Hopper invented COBOL computer language. And Stephanie Kwolek invented Kevlar in 1971. So there are women out there doing things that you take advantage of well, maybe you don't use your, your um, liquid paper and disposable diapers every day, but you know about them. And here's just some very famous women in science. This is Gertie Corey, who worked with her husband for many, many years. And he got a um, professorship position, and she worked mostly as an unpaid assistant. Um, but they... Uh, figured out the, they traced carbon in metabolism, basically. I think that's an easy way to say it. So they figured out a lot of metabolism. Barbara McClintock, who uh, discovered transposable elements, which is probably one of the weirdest genetic phenomena to come across the face of the earth. And it was not believed for a long time, uh, partly because it's so weird and partly because it was a woman that uh, came up with it. And uh, Rosalind Franklin, who, along with James Watson and Francis Crick, helped elucidate the structure of DNA. The comment that James Watson made of her was, if she only dressed a little nicer, maybe people would have liked her more. Okay. Well, I, that's enough for me. I want to uh, very, very quickly talk about how I got to science. This is how I got to science. I read this book. So go out and read books. Be careful what you read, though, because it just might change your life. I read this book back in the day and uh, ended up, I had already gotten a degree in dental hygiene and had been working as a dental hygienist for seven years and I disliked the career, I didn't know what to do. I became a dental hygienist because my mother had been one and I had aunts who had been dental hygienists. I didn't know about much else. No one, in, even though I graduated in, uh, from my high school with very, very high grades and was living in the middle of the uh, scientific revolution involving the beginning of personal computing, genetics, and uh, space travel, Nobody ever said to me, hey, why don't you go, get, go into science? Why don't you be a doctor? Nobody ever said that to me. But after I worked for a while, I read this book and I said, that sounds like way lots of fun. This is the story of the discovery of DNA, or the discovery of the structure of DNA. So I went back to school and got a PhD in biochemistry, and here I am. So that's it. And uh, I thank you. Uh, now he's going to talk to me. Dr. Yordanova. Oh, wow, I can follow such an elaborate presentation. I just have a few pieces of paper, but I will try to give you a brief overview of 
my way of how I became a scientist and also a little bit about the history of uh, women in Bulgaria when I was growing up. Obviously, I'm not a Native American, so um, I was born in Bulgaria in a mm, few years back. <laughs> Um, so I was born in Bulgaria in 1974, actually, during the blossoming years of the communistic regime. And I don't remember much from the first years of my life, but um, I will try to tell you what I remember uh, from the later stages of my life there and uh, when I came in America. So as early as I was in middle school, I recall that there was this push by the communistic regime for the emancipation of women in Bulgaria. Although elements of paternalism and emphasis on traditional female roles remained strong in the society. Just a little bit of history about the communistic regime. After the Second World War, Bulgaria became a communistic country, so I grew up half of my life during this regime. So Things were different compared to after the communistic regime. Just keep that in mind. The 1971 constitution of Bulgaria stated that all citizens of the People's Republic of Bulgaria are equal before the law and no privileges or limitations of rights based on national, religious, sex, race, or educational differences are permitted and that women and men in the People's Republic of Bulgaria have the same rights. Great so far. We have it in the Constitution, we have the same rights. The statistics also show that the Bulgaria's workforce around that time included almost equal number of men and women. 50.1% men and 49.9% women. I remember that my mother and all of our female friends and relatives were working various kinds of jobs and none of them were stay-home moms, except if they had to take a maternity leave. I didn't know what means a stay-home mom. That term did not exist. While all of the women that I knew growing up had full-time jobs. The household chores remained primarily their responsibility. Women, including my mother and all our friends and relatives, would spend around eight or a little more hours at their jobs every day. And in addition, three to four hours doing household work afterwards. In majority of the households, cooking, cleaning, washing, mending children were still considered woman's work, to which men contributed little. Based on my observations, I would say at the workplace, most of the women were treated equal to men, although some men would express resentment of women in position of authority. By law, women were prohibited from doing work which would affect their health and childbearing abilities, but women often took these kinds of jobs because they were offering better pay and benefits. I remember the women that I knew were doing all kinds of different jobs that men were doing, but at the same time, jobs such as archivist, librarian, court, se uh, ticket seller, were strictly reserved for women only. You cannot see a librarian or a car archivist or ticket seller a man. That would be unbelievable, actually. Although women were treated quite respectfully by men at work, historically the status of wives was distinctly secondary. Only in the recent decades, men began to console their wives in family decisions. Earlier, even when I was growing up in Bulgaria, wives were expected to give blind obedience to their husbands, especially in the more rural areas of the country. The wife was responsible for all the work inside, and inside the house and for helping in the field as well. As a result of these family arrangements, Children were expected to begin sharing the household work at an early age. 
By age 12, 13, girls had usually mastered most of the traditional household skills. And I can vivid, vividly recall doing all the different household chores when I was growing up, when I was that old. There was no question, would you like to do it? Can I give you 50 cents? You were just expected to do it. And that was it. At the time I was growing up in Bulgaria, they were, there was a great emphasis on education as well. The education was free, available to everybody, and required to a certain grade. Um, the communist rule in Bulgaria promoted literacy so that the communist-controlled press can be disseminated throughout the society. Everybody needed to know to read so they can read the communistic press. Great idea. The communist rule in Bulgaria promoting literacy in that way um, kind of helped girls at that time. And I would say one positive side of the affordable education um, allowed many girls to take advantage of it and to find better realization in the work field. I consider myself one of those lucky people that took advantage of the free education and I finished high school and I knew that I wanted to continue my studies in a university and became a chemistry teacher. I always wanted that. After the communist regime fell apart in the fall of 1989, in the fall of 1992 I was accepted to be a chemistry major student in the most prestigious university in Bulgaria at the time the Sofia University. Back then, as well as now, to be accepted in a particular major, you apply for that major. You know you want to be a chemistry major, you apply to get to the chemistry major. You can do what you guys can do. Two years take core classes and you don't decide a major until you have to graduate, pretty much. <laughs> so back then, as well as now, to be accepted in a particular major, you compete with thousands of other candidates during a grueling five-hour written specialized entrance exam. And what is interesting to emphasize here is that out of the 150 chemistry major students that were accepted the year I was accepted, only one-fourth of them were male students. Most of the students across the different majors were females, except in engineering. And as a result of the smaller percentage of men applying to graduate school, they were accepted easier with lower grades. The competition among females for every seat in the university was much tougher, and the top tier was accepted only with very high grades on the entrance exam. It was hard to compete to get accepted at the university, but it was even harder to maintain excellent academic status while I was a student. It was hard, not always because studying chemistry is really demanding, but because, on, uh, because of the way female students were treated occasionally. Every year, more girls were accepted to be chemistry majors than boys, and yet most of our professors were male professors. Women used to go to college, finish their degree, and go back home to find a job near their family. Although the situation has changed some nowadays, only very few of the women that go to college try to get a PhD and pursue a research or academic career and stay at the university. Sometimes the male professors uh, would treat us in such a way, humiliate or underestimate us, that it was tough for um, female students to stay in the field and want to continue their education. So my dream always was to be a chemistry teacher, but um, I decided my uh, I have to try something different and I should specialize, specialize in theoretical physical chemistry. Everywhere, traditionally, this branch of chemistry is male dominated, even nowadays, so I can say I chose the hard way. 
And yes, I will never forget the first day of physical chemistry class. The first few words of the male professor, he came in the room. It was a big room, 150 people there, mostly women. He looked at us and he just said, well, girls, I hope you really have the strength and determination to study physical chemistry. I don't think that many of you will succeed in this class. Can you imagine what would be if I say that in my class? <laughs> in any form and shape, I'll be fired within five minutes. We can't do that. Back then, they could say anything. And the interesting part is that probably it was really insulting and diminishing to most of the girls in the class. It had the opposite reaction for me. It was one of the most inspiring and motivational moments in my life. This few discouraging words made me even more determined to try to stand for myself and prove first to myself, of course, and to this professor and um, to everybody that I and we, all the female students, can be accomplished physical chemists just as anybody else. After this memorable incident, there was no point of returning for me. Of course, I always wanted to be a chemistry teacher, but I have decided that I will fight and try to become a physical chemist, which is slightly different. And it worked somewhat for me. In um, 1998, I was accepted to be a PhD candidate in the University of Notre Dame and two years later I transferred to Penn State and in 2003 I obtained my PhD degree in the area of computational physical chemistry. If you can guess this area of chemistry is also heavily dominated by male scientists but this never discouraged or intimidated me since I've been uh, in USA studying or working, I haven't had any major um, incidents, conflicts because of being a uh, female scientist, but the situation back in Bulgaria when I was a student was completely different. There were many cases when we were judged by our appearance, appearance and talked to inappropriate, inappropriately or simply overlooked as female students. And you may wonder how anybody can tolerate such a treatment. We didn't know better. That was the standard. We didn't know that we can stand for our rights. We didn't know that we can complain. And actually, the problem was that we didn't think anything was wrong. When you don't know better and you don't think anything is wrong, you don't have problems. Over the last two decades, the situation has changed dramatically and women in Bulgaria are much more respected, not only at work, but in the house as well. It is still not perfect, of course, yet. And we all know that even here in USA, as Elizabeth showed the statistics, men are better paid than women for the same quality and type of work. And in some situations, women are still considered as very good servants, but nothing more. And what we need to do is we need to stand up for ourselves, our rights and dignity, and prove that we can do anything we put our mind into. What I learned in my life is that anything negative that happens, I can take either one of two ways. I can get discouraged from pursuing my dreams, or I can become more motivated, stronger, and even more determined to succeed. I always choose the second one, if anybody of you know me. Some do. What is your choice? So my speech is short, but after we hear Dr. Harvey, I would like you to ask questions, because I'm sure you don't know much about the, the way women become scientists in Bulgaria or the way um, things happen elsewhere. So I want you to 
interact, ask questions, so we can have a good discussion in the end. Don't fall asleep, we have one more speaker. Or like the few people that are sleeping, you can wake them up. Thank you. There is one thing that I cannot tolerate in my classes, no, two things, cell phones and sleeping. If anybody is, I, I don't see who is here, but my students know, if you even try to close your eyes for more than four seconds, I call you by name and it's not pleasant. So just listen, guys. Well, my name is Dr. Stephanie Harvey, and I did get my PhD from UT Knoxville in plant and soil science. Um, I have to say that overall I had a kind of strange experience coming up from, uh, through the educational process. Um, I will say that I, was, I hit a time, I came along in a time when women were encouraged to do things um, beyond being a mother and, and a homemaker, but overall they still were kind of assumed that if you were female you were going to go into certain roles. And I can remember when I was getting ready to graduate from high school and everybody was like, well, they assumed that I was going to college because I graduated top of my class. And they assumed that. But their assumptions on what I was going to go to school in always kind of, kind of just wanted to, you know, grit my teeth and go, no. Because they assumed that I was going to go be a teacher or that I was going to go into nursing. Because anytime I'd mention something about the medical field, they, oh, you're going to go be a nurse. I'm like, no. I'm thinking about going to be a doctor. And that's actually how I started out as was a, as a pre-med student. I quickly realized that there was no way in the world I wanted to listen to people who were ill talk about their illnesses all day long. I was like, this is not for me. Um, but I knew I wanted to go on and move forward in uh, my educational process. I started out as an undergrad at Wesleyan College in Macon. Um, Wesleyan's the first female, uh, first college chartered to grant degrees to women. And, um, it technically is still an all-women's college, although they do allow males to receive degrees now in their master's program. So from, on an under, from an undergraduate standpoint, I had a very unique experience in that I was filled, I was in classrooms that were nothing but females. Um, I did have one PE class with a guy, which was a really bizarre experience. Um, but other than that, my classes were filled with women, and they were women that were seeking degrees not in the traditional fields for the most part. Um, the majority of the professors on our campus uh, were still male, but it was definitely a much higher ratio of females than you would expect in most universities at the time. Um, about 50% of the professors there were female. Um, so there was definitely a difference there, and there were definitely role models in place for higher education. Uh, from there, I went on to a master's degree um, at Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville. Um, where I joined a relatively small group of graduate students. And at the time in which I started, I was the only female. We all shared an office. They were all herpetologists. And every time I opened my refrigerator, there was a dead snake or mice inside it. And it was my refrigerator. My sister had loaned it to me. She never wanted it back after that. But it was, you know, we got along well. There were, I had no problems with anyone. I actually had two female professors. There were, again, Definitely a lower ratio. I think there were three females out of the two departments in my building, which was chemistry and biology. And there were probably about 30 professors total, and about three of them were female. Um, so again, definitely a skewed uh, percentage of females to males. Um, I went on to get a PhD in plant and soil science. Uh, this is definitely a field dominated by males. It's on the ag agricultural campus at UT, which is actually in Knoxville as well. Um, and this is definitely a traditionally male field uh, department or school. Um, plant and soil science primarily deals with crop uh, components from the soil analysis uh, through plants, plant growth, cropping systems, uh, that a little bit of horticulture, not too much. Some horticulture is actually a separate department. Um, and again, most, most of the individuals that were seeking degrees typically were males. When I started my program, I entered into a lab that consisted of a single female, me, 
um, in an apartment with about 25 or 30 faculty members, one of which was female. She was only, she was an associate professor at that rank and had been at that rank for about 15 years. And I, again, you know, as a graduate student, you're always listening to everything that is being said by the professors and that are sitting around chatting. That's somewhere where your best knowledge can be gained. And I overheard many of conversations that probably I shouldn't have overheard. And one of them was discussing her chances at getting promoted to a full professor. And it was basically said, she'll never get full professor. She doesn't do any research. Well, her position, and she was the only one in the department that had this position, she was on an 80, I think it was 80-20, or it might have been 90-10 track, which means that most of her time was supposed to be spent teaching. Everyone else in the department was more 80-20 research to teaching. So they were supposed to be doing research. They would teach one class, one class every two years. That was their requirement. The rest of the time, they get to do research. She, on the other hand, was teaching three courses a semester, three to four, with sometimes up to 80 to 120 students in the class. But she was not going to qualify for a full professorship. Had she been a male, maybe it would have made a difference because she definitely was not, she did not get to join into the reindeer game, so to speak. She was never invited to their coffee, their coffee meetings. Um, in fact, you barely, rarely saw her actually in the building because she spent so much time actually teaching. Um, I did have some very good role models at UT um, from the, uh, some other people outside of my department. There were other females on the campus, um, again, but they were fairly few. Over the whole ag campus, agricultural campus, there were probably only three female uh, faculty members of rank uh, on the whole campus. Um, so they were fairly limited. While I was at UT and uh, continuing my degree, the, there was definitely a shift, however, in the student population, the graduate student population. My lab in particular was one of the larger labs, and we went from I being the only female to there being a sole male in the department, in the, or the sole male in the lab, and the rest of the members being all female. So a definite shift. As far as the attitudes from fellow uh, graduate students, other programs, or faculty toward me in general, um, I was uh, never, I never received any type of poor behavior from, the, from other individuals or slide comments. And for the most part, they gave me, they expected me to do what I was told to do when I was told to do it. And I did, regardless of what, what type of job it was. And I volunteered for stuff constantly. So even some of the, um, the, uh, the kind of tried and true ranks of the professors who had been around for many years, and did tend to look less favorably on many female graduate students. They liked me because I did computer stuff for them and they had no clue what was going on with their computers. So if I could fix it, they thought I was great. So I did have a little bit of an advantage that way. Um, but in general, again, we didn't really have a lot of problems in our department other than the fact, again, it was definitely a male-dominated department. Um, since I've gotten a PhD, since I've uh, finished, I have had some few small issues. Um, one of the biggest things I found is that in a department, oftentimes the females, regardless of their rank, are often asked to do what I would tradi what be traditionally considered more administrative tasks, um, things that you might normally hand the secretary. Um, you've been expected to, to handle things like that. Um, and from a teacher's prof professor perspective, one of the things that I kind of get upset about is when students call me Miss Harvey or Mrs. Harvey. Because statistics have shown that students will call a, call a male professor doctor far more frequently than they will address their, the female uh, professors as doctor. So if sometimes we get a little bitchy because you refer to us as Miss or Mrs., that's why. We deserve the respect just like the males do. And sometimes it takes a little bit more of a forceful attitude to get that respect, particularly from students. Okay, we do have some time, a little bit of time for some questions. So I will take those now. Unfortunately, I 
Unfortunately, there's a lot of research that shows that still, in as young as grammar school, that young, the boys are still encouraged in math and science far more than young the girls are. And I'm wondering what you all think we should do to stop that. How do we encourage girls to become interested in STEM fields so that the, the disparities that we saw in the slide can stop? Uh, is this on? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, well, I, I think that the, we have to put out there into the popular culture, really, uh, the idea that it's cool, it's good, it's, it's great for women to be in science. Um, I, I think probably the, our best bet is Abby. Abby, I don't know her last name. Shuto. Shuto. Abby Shuto is a character on NCIS. She was voted the most popular character on television uh, a year or so ago. And she's a scientist and she's crazy and I love her and I think we need to put people like that, get pictures like that out from students so that every, not just students, the mothers of students, the teachers of students and people out there. And I think we just, we have to push those, that image out. It's really hard to do, but she's the probably our best story. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Well, that's not comparable. But then there's always the question of, well, we get another job. 
um, so that we're kind of holding, they're kind of holding their body for the hostage to some extent. And for most of us, I think we just have to kind of accept that when we take a job, that's unfortunately, unfortunately, the effect of a lot of times there would be you know, more um, applicants than there are jobs. And so we often do accept lower wages um, as a result of needing, you know, needing a job. I think society as a whole has to change. And, we're, and women are still viewed as expected to have a family, expected to be married and have kids, and their income being set. And I think that's one of the driving forces that's kind of behind that, is that we seem to supplement income, not as the, the household income. And I think that's the reason that has to be changed. But I would say you have to stand up for yourself no matter what and be more active and outgoing and really show people that women are no less than men in any area. But if you're not ready to fight, if you're not ready to be aggressive, you will be overlooked any time possible. So you, you just have to fight and stand up for yourself all the time. Or at least be ready to do it. I was wondering if we could have a show of hands of how many women in the audience are science majors. What brought me to the States to further your education in the fall area? What brought me? Yes, sir. Like, why did you want to, like, you know, continue education in the States? <laughs> Two things, mainly. I was, I was gonna have something to do, which means earn some money during a very bad economical time in Bulgaria at that time. It was the, one of the biggest recessions when I came here. And second of all, I always wanted to continue my education. And in Bulgaria, it was much harder than here. In Bulgaria, pretty much, I have to tell you guys, a professor has to die in order somebody to step higher or go up. If nobody dies, uh, there is no promotion. So I knew there are not many chances for me there to grow, but coming in the United States, I thought there is, there are better opportunities and definitely more chances for me. But it was financial and what I wanted to do at the time. Not directly with the excuse, oh, because you're a woman, but we apply for jobs and we don't always get them when we don't know why. <laughs> I don't think that anybody would say that. I applied for a position um, at an agricultural institute, and one of the only negative thing that was actually given to me as far as comments was, we don't know how to drive a tractor. <laughs> it was a teaching position. I wasn't applying to be in the farm. <laughs> I was never, uh, that I know of, not uh, offered a job because I'm a woman. But while I was in, while I was uh, an assistant professor at Rush Presbyterian in Chicago, and I had a research position there, um, I was denied uh, funding because 
and I'm pretty sure that was because I was a woman. Uh, the gentleman who was in charge of the collaboration funds would not allow me to be part of the collaborative because of the fact that I was a woman. He was he did not believe that I had the intellectual fortitude to carry out the job. Um, 
Uh, there certainly um, are areas that are more female oriented or female friendly, I guess. But I think what you have to do is you have to stand up for yourself, be tenacious, don't give up. I mean, the, the, the women, we saw some women here who were pioneers. They went and did, against all odds, just did what they had felt they had to do. And because of that, made the field more open to women later. So you have to go out there, be strong, stand up for yourself, but also be really good and show people you can do it. Thank you. Um, being here at Georgia Southwestern, this is my first year. I'm a freshman, and I've noticed that there's a lot more female professors here, and I was wondering if there has been like segregation or kind of like more women are um, given jobs down here in the south, or more in the north, or is there like certain universities that do that, or? <laughs> I think that there's probably more women in GSW than there are men because GSW is a teaching institution. And we pay less. And we pay less than anyone else in the state. And, and our men get promoted into administrative positions. And men get promoted to administrative. So if you look at the uh, cross section of GSW, it's actually a little microcosm of what's going on. Because uh, the most administrative positions are men, uh, and but I would say primarily the reason you see a lot of women here is because <coughs> it's a teaching institution. So that's what I think. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? You mentioned that there is a low expectation for women. Do you think that young women who realize this expectation use it as kind of a backup plan for Can you repeat it? Yes. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that uh, there's a low expectation for women. Do you think that young women realize this low expectation and use it as a backup plan for don't succeed? I don't know. <laughs> Um, there is a, I think people have low expectations for women. I think that you generally, in life, you wait long enough, you get what you expect. And if you have low expectations of yourself, you, you will perform in a low manner, but uh, you have to have high expectations for yourself. I think that's the, the key, the key, the key point isn't what someone expects of me as much as what I expect of myself. I agree. I never had a plan B. Never had a plan B. <laughs> Actually, I'm already living my plan Q. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I think we're going to wrap this up then. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out for the 10th Women's Series Lecture Series. And I hope to see you all on the 11th one. And have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you.